to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Welcome once again to our studies in the Book of Psalms called Songs of a Heart Set Free. Today we come to Psalm 25, which we could call the A to Z of Going God's Way. Each verse in Psalm 25 begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It starts with the Hebrew A, which is Aleph, and verse 2 has the letter Beth, which is B, and it goes through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet corresponding to the 22 verses. If you look closely, you can see that each of the verses begins with the actual Hebrew letter of the alphabet that begins that verse. To help us understand a little better, we'll just look at those first three verses. And I've got in red the letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is Aleph, Beth, and Gimel. The first three letters of the Hebrew alphabet corresponding to A, B, C. And so if I put ABC instead, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So it kind of goes through the 22 verses. If it was written in English, it might have looked something like this. I've given you an English alternative. Now, this isn't correct, but it's just to help you understand what's, what's actually happening in the Hebrew. Where you see in verse 1, it says, Always to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For the second verse, Because in you I trust, O my God. And then the third verse begins with the letter C. Certainly no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Demonstrate your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Escort me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. 
And now when we come to verse 6, you will know that there's a letter that's been left out here in verse 6. And that, of course, is the letter F. And where is the F? Well, it's not there. And this is what's happened in the Hebrew, is that the, the corresponding letter in the Hebrew alphabet was left off. It could well be that at that time in the history of the Hebrew alphabet, that letter just was left out in when they recited the Hebrew alphabet. It's possible. We, we, it's a long time ago. We just don't know. So anyway, let, we, let's just go on. In, in verse 6, we, we skip to the next letter. Gracious Lord, remember your mercy and love, for they are of from old. Hold not in memory the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Verse 8, immensely good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. Justly, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Kind and faithful are the ways of the Lord for those who keep the demands of his covenant. In verse 11 reads, Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. And I've set it off by itself because this really brings us to the whole key of going God's way, is this admission and this understand, this self-awareness that our iniquity is very great and in, in need of God's forgiveness. And so we have this hard cry from David. David doesn't come to God with, with the confidence of someone who thinks he has what it takes to go God's way. You cannot go God's way simply by sheer grit of will and determination. Going God's way involves humbling yourself and being aware of your own self that you cannot go God's way. First, you must come to God seeking his forgiveness because we are out of fellowship with God by nature of the fall of Adam and Eve, the fall of the human race, where we have become a race of sinful people, rebels from God, and therefore, we are in need of forgiveness. We are in need of the relationship being restarted. God is the one who took the initiative in making it possible by sending his son Jesus into this world, his sent one, his Messiah, our king, to come and humble himself and die for our sins, the forgiveness of our sins died for our crookedness, our iniquity, our sin. And he took our guilt upon himself. And we must recognize that in, in us and recognize God's plan in sending Jesus into this world. And then we're, this is the heart of the matter where we, we must have this heart of the matter if we are going to understand the ABCs or the A to Z of going God's way. The alphabet carries on in verse 12. May the man that fears the Lord be shown the way chosen for him. Not only will he spend his days in prosperity, but his descendants will inherit the land. Oh, only to those who fear him will the Lord make known his covenant. And that's followed by P. Perpetually my eyes are on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Q. Quickly turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. R. Rapidly have the troubles of my heart multiplied. Free me from my anguish. And then T. Oh, we've missed the letter again. This also happens in the Hebrew between 17 and 18. The, the letter that you would expect to be happening, uh, in English anyway, that's the S, is missing. And instead, we've moved on to the next letter, which is T. 
Think upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. But not only that, in verse 19, we also have the letter T. So you got two in a row with the same letter. Take notice of how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Uphold my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. V, for virtue and uprightness, will protect me because my hope is in you. Now that brings us to the end of verse 21. This is really where the alphabet is ending because uh, the, the Hebrew letters, this would correspond to the last Hebrew letter. In English, we have 26 letters and we end in Z, but in because of the, this being the a Hebrew Psalm, we can't do that. Uh, so I want you to notice that the very last verse goes back to the same letter that we found in an earlier verse, Q. So it's second time for that letter to be used. And it is quash all of Israel's troubles, O God. It is an alphabet acrostic, but not perfectly so. And, and that's not to say that David made a mistake. I think that uh, there are reasons that maybe we don't fully understand. It would help if we were native Hebrew speakers of the time to understand what is going on here and because it's a memory device and if if you interrupt the alphabet for uh, when you're trying to use it as a memory device then you there's also some other reason that you're using uh, these changes in the what is expected you're trying to introduce some new thought we don't need to worry about that because the the psalm is still a blessing to us Without knowledge, uh, without knowledge of Hebrew, but it's it's to help us understand that um, the structure of the psalm being built upon the Hebrew alphabet, obviously it, it imposes limitations upon the writer uh, as to how he can express himself, and it could even impose in, in limitations on what you talk about in in regard to which words you can choose, and. That has led some people to think that maybe uh, that's all Psalm 25 is about. It's just a, maybe a hodgepodge of verses loosely related. And I, I'll have to say that I, I don't see that to be the case, and we'll discuss why in just a moment. In Psalm 25, there are two different viewpoints going on in the, in the, upon the part of David. And uh, if you can see, the, uh, the all of the verses of Psalm 25 are on the screen. Some of them are in black, and some of them are in red. And what that means is that the psalm starts, those all those red verses, are the first seven verses are all in red. All of those verses, David is speaking to God directly. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And each one of the verses that follows up to verse 7 is the same way. So it's addressing God himself. But then in suddenly in verse 8, David is no longer addressing God. He's speaking third person about God to you, the reader. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. And so you learn about the Lord, listening to David. And that carries on for those three verses, verse 8, 9, and 10. Then all of a sudden, verse 11 is read, meaning that he has turned his heart to the Lord again. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. This is the very heart of the psalm. And, and you can see it there visually. Verse 12 through 15 are verses speaking about God to the reader. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? God will instruct him in the way chosen for him. And on it goes like that. Then verse 16, it picks it up again where David again turns his heart to the Lord 
turn to me and be gracious to me for I am lonely and afflicted and so on and carries on to 21 which is where it kind of ends the main body of the of the psalm may integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you or in some translations will say because I wait upon, upon you and then as if almost like an add-on verse 22 says redeem Israel O God from all their troubles that leads to one of the ways in which we can give an outline for Psalm 25. It's almost, you can almost do it like in three pieces as, as you see there. The first red section being the part one and the, the content of that first part there kind of hovers around the idea of David in a, in a sentence saying, remember me in your love. And going on to the second section, instruct me in your ways. And then that third section, free me from my troubles. To help us understand maybe what, what are some of the big ideas involved, let's look at some of the words and the, the frequency of their use. Let's start with number 12, which is trouble. The word trouble is found two times in the NIV Bible. Trouble is found in verse 17 and in verse 22. Number 11, fear. This is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. It's found in two verses, 12 and verse 14. Number 10, enemies. Enemies are found two times in Psalm 25, in verse 2, and towards the end, in verse 19. Number 9, and this is an unusual one, it is the word covenant, found twice. In verse 10, and then again in verse 14. Number 8, sin. In verse 7, Eight, and then verse 18. Number seven, good or goodness. Found three times using two different words. Number six is the word love. And it's God's love that is spoken of here, his covenant love. Verse six, verse seven, and verse 10. Now, number five, remember. Remember is found three times and they are found closely together, all of them. It's found in verse six and then found twice in verse seven. Then the word hope in the NIV is found three times. In other translations, you might find wait, verse three, verse five, and verse 21. Number three, of the most frequently used words and ideas in Psalm 25, number three is shame. Shame is mentioned four times in this Psalm. It's mentioned in verse two, then twice in verse three, and then it is mentioned again towards the end of the Psalm in verse 20. So something that was on David's mind the, it has the idea of disappointment, not wanting to be disappointed. Number two, teaching or instructing. And uh, we'll find that five times in Psalm 25. The word teach is found in verse four, verse five, and verse nine. And then the idea of instructing in verse eight and verse 12, which are uh, representing two different Hebrew words one of which, uh, the one in verse uh, in verse 8 and 12, instruct, is actually the verb form of the word Torah, which is the, the law of Moses or the instruction of Moses, the teaching of Moses. And now finally we come to the, the most frequently found idea or word in Psalm 25. Do you know what it is? It is the word way. 
way and mostly the way of the Lord, God's way. And that's why we called the psalm today, we call the, the sermon, the A to Z of going God's way. The idea of way or path or, or being led in God's way is found eight times in this psalm. This is a psalm that is intended for those who want to go God's way. Verse 4 says, Show me your ways, O Lord. That is the very first reference, and that's the hint for the rest of the psalm, that this is what's at the heart of what David wants. Because David doesn't feel like he's really knowing God's ways. He has a sin problem, which he alludes to in the psalm, and the very heart of the psalm, asking God for forgiveness. He wants to go God's way, even though he has this problem. He also wants to go God's way because of his enemies and the trouble that he receives at the hands of his enemies and the trouble that he receives because of his sin. Verse 5, lead me in your truth or guide me in your truth, as the NIV says. The message translation says it this way, take me by thy hand, lead me down the path of truth. And that is, that is such a good thought because see, not only does God make the path or the way for us to go, but he also leads us into that path and guides us to that path. In verse eight, David says, God instructs sinners in his ways. Isn't that good? That's hope. Hope for everyone. That no matter what you have done, there is hope for you because God can instruct you in his ways no matter what you have done. Do you want to go God's way? Then have a really good think about the, the things going on in Psalm 25, 25 and emulate David in his prayers to God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Do that before the Lord yourself. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Verse 9 says that God leads, God guides. Who? the humble in what is right. God guides the humble, not the proud. You can't stand on your own merits before God and expect that God is, is going to help you. God hates pride. God will not accept the proud, but he gives grace to the humble and he will lead the humble to go his way. And verse 12, who then is the man who fears the Lord? God will instruct him in the way chosen for him. See, God chooses the path, he makes the path, and he guides you into the path. We really do have here the A to Z of going God's way. The person who fears the Lord is the one that God will instruct. The person who is humble before the Lord is the one whom God will teach his way. Are you a sinner? Are you one who has rebelled against God? Uh, even as David spoke about his rebellious ways, then there is hope for you. It's as Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he, when he said those words, he was speaking in, in, to a mixed crowd of people like drunkards and people who were not respected in society, people who others can, would look down upon. And he said to, to them that they were the ones that he came to call I've come not to call the righteous, but those sinners to repentance, to show them God's way. And God's way is on our knees through uh, a change of mind and faith in him. And so it's a, um, it's a slap in the face 
for those other people in the crowd that Jesus was talking to, who thought of themselves as righteous and as better than other people, who thought of themselves as religious and doing quite well uh, in terms of, of external observances of, of doing things that would be respectable and well thought of in the community. They stand on the merit of those things. They find themselves in opposition to the Son of God. We must humble ourselves in God's sight and, and not in any way take credit for the good that God has allowed us to, uh, to do. Every good and perfect gift, even that which is in our lives, comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no uh, variableness, no shadow of turning. He is unchanging. And he, he always has respect for those who are humble, but disdains those who are proud. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. He is the one who will lead you in God's ways. He is the one whose voice you need to follow. He is the shepherd that we talked about uh, last uh in the last couple of weeks, in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. He is that shepherd that we are to follow. He is that shepherd who leads his sheep. He knows us and we follow him and he gives to us eternal life. And sh the sheep are humble things. There's nothing much great about them. They get into a lot of trouble. They're a little bit wayward, and so are we. But God grants guidance. God grants his instruction. He's willing to confide in us. That's where the, that one verse is really, really interesting. It's not just that God instructs us and teach us, teaches us in his way. It says, actually, that God confides in those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. So then that's where I think where it's quite clear that the real covenant that God is interested in, that covenant between him and mankind that has been brought about through his son, the Lord Jesus, where he said, you know, uh, as he as he celebrated communion on the, the celebrated his last supper with his disciples. After the meal, he said, taking a, a, a glass of wine, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And this covenant is something that is not really understood by those who are outside of it, unless they are quite close to the kingdom of God. And God gives, grants them that understanding. He gives them that instruction. See, God confides in those to those who fear him and makes known to them his covenant and you can be a part of that covenant you can be a part of that group of people in whom God confides you can be a friend of God in this way and receive instruction from the Lord, receive an insight into life and reality and everything in a way that you might never have understood before. God's Holy Spirit will come into your life and will teach you things that you had no idea about. You need to come to God in the name of Jesus, his Son. Repent of your sins, turn away in your heart, and put your faith in Jesus as the only one who can save you. He died so that all of your sins would be taken away, and so you could be accepted by God as a child of God.
Oh, Father. With these uh, varied and uh, kind of scattered thoughts about Psalm 25, I pray that there'll be something here that blesses the heart of the person that's listening right now and that you will use it to grant them an understanding of how it how it is you go a person goes your way you are the one who wants to lead us and i pray that everyone who's listening right now might be able to experience the leading of god and the ability that over time they understand that you are leading them and that they are finding themselves in the way of the Lord.